that Carol or, or, or Angelique would want to start. Um, I, 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 my understanding of the topic is about race and social justice as it relates to the Caribbean and the United States. I, I hope that that, that is what, um, that that is the correct interpretation of it. So um, in terms of the, the, that relationship of the contribution of Caribbean people to the United States, I think it is important that we understand that in historical terms. And to do that, I think that it, it is important that we not look at the relationship between the Caribbean and the United States in its contemporary form. I think we need to look at, at that relationship through the long arc of, um, of history. And one of the ways I think to start that, that conversation is to look at the rebelliousness of the enslaved Africans in the Caribbean who forced England to move much of their assets to the mainland USA uh, in, in terms of a lot of the planters and their slaves who were moved from Barbados to South Carolina. Indeed, by 1671, roughly half of the Europeans and more than half of the Africans who were residing in South Carolina came from Barbados. And what we know is that from time to time, um, a number of white uh, South Carolinians returned to Barbados in order to trace their own ancestry. Added to that development, we should be mindful of the cumulative impact of the revolts and the, the forms of resistance that we have in the Caribbean that, that have been going on. Um, there, there was, for example, the Boca de Negua, uh, Sugar Mill Rebellion in the Dominican Republic in 1521. And then, of course, there is the resistance of the Maroons of Jamaica and of Suriname. There is Taki, Taki's Revolt. And then there is the Burbis Revolution, the Burbis Rebellion um, of 1763, which inspired, in some ways, the Haitian Revolution which started in 1791 and ended in 1804 with independence for Haiti uh, and uh, the signature um, uh, move of, the, of Haiti being the only successful black revolution in this hemisphere. Uh, we, we ask ourselves then, what is the connection, if any, between the Haitian revolution and the United States? And what I always say is that if there is no Haitian revolution, there is no Louisiana purchase. Needing money, Napoleon Bonaparte offered to sell to the US French Louisiana. The purchase did not just involve Louisiana, however, it included Arkansas, Missouri, Iowa, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, Minnesota, North Dakota, most of South Dakota, part of New Mexico, parts of of Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Louisiana, and New Orleans. In other words, the Louisiana purchase resulted in the United States doubling in size. And I think that's a fairly uh, significant contribution that comes out of what is happening in terms of the forms of resistance taking place in, in the Caribbean. So that the contribution uh, of the Caribbean to the US is a profoundly historical one. Uh, moreover, what we can easily discern is in, in these historical moments are the contributions to social justice. So there, there, there are social justice issues that are built in to the, the historical acts. When we move into the 20th century, uh, then we, we, can, we, we begin to see more clearly the relationship between the Caribbean and the US in terms of its early radicals, in, uh, particularly in Harlem, and I'm thinking here of Richard B. Moore, of Barbados, of W.A. Domingo, of Jamaica, of Otto Hugheswood, of Suriname, and Cyril Briggs of St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, what is also significant is that as they are struggling for social justice in the United States, they're doing a similar thing in terms of their connection to the Caribbean. And so 
while the, the group in, in particularly in Harlem is concerned with the question of the defense of the Scottsboro Boys in the 1930s, they're equally concerned with the emerging consciousness about trade unionism in the 30s in the United States. And later on, they're as involved in this question of um, independence in, in the Caribbean. And so there's a remarkable uh, set of contacts uh, that are, are taking place between the New York group of Domingo and, and, and so on, uh, and, the, uh, and Winter Crawford in Barbados, uh, each informing the other about the nature of race and social struggle and the question of justice. Uh, Crawford was the founder and leader of the West Indian National Congress. In addition, we have somebody like Arthur Schomburg uh, of Puerto Rico, who also is very much involved, not only in the research and the archiving of the lives of black people in the United States, but who was actually involved in the cause of independence, both in Puerto Rico and in Cuba. Of course, we can't possibly talk about Caribbean contributions to race and social justice in the United States without talking about the role of Hubert Harrison, who in fact introduced Marcus Garvey to the Harlem audience, and Marcus Garvey himself, who had one of the largest black organizations in the United States, in the history of the United States. I remember that Garvey's movement was not just national, but international. Um, as indicated in the last webinar, there's also the outstanding contribution of uh, to the, the civil rights movement and civil rights struggle in the United States by Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Touri, the Trinidad born uh, black power advocate. So let me, let me conclude my, my introductory remarks um, by reference to a letter sent to Stokely Carmichael by CLR James, who heard him for the first time in Canada and who was so impressed by what he had heard that he wrote him a, a, a detailed letter and sent it to him. Uh, at the time, so Clicker Michael is, is 24. But what I think is interesting is what CLR James has to say to, to uh, the young Stokely Michael. He says, the great weakness of the black struggle in the United States was that it, it it lacked the sound, it lacked the sound historical and theoretical basis. James argued that in so far, in, in, in such a far reaching struggle, what was needed was to know where it was, where it had come from, and where it was going. I think that what James was attempting to convey to Stokely Carmichael is that he needed to understand the shoulders on which he was standing. And what James then implored him to do was to become more familiar with the, the work and the contribution of, of Marcus Garvey, of Hubert Harrison, of Aimé Césaire, of Fanon, of Pandbour. And of course, he didn't mention it in that particular article, but, but then of, of uh, CLR James himself, um, who did a considerable amount of work about the black struggle in the United States. Thank you. Professor Davies, would you like to go next? Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to join you for the CSE webinar. Thank you to Christina Hines and Tavis Jules for their work in creating this forum. Uh, Caribbean American Connections, Social Justice, Shared Dreams, Race, Gender, Sexuality. My contribution is on gender and social justice. Hopefully, by the end, we can discuss if the dreams are really shared. What I will present today will be done in four points, offering positions and examples from some of the theorists, la activists, largely women, some more studied than others, but each of whom are deserving of further study. One. A stream of Caribbean initiatives across the Americas have been advanced to develop societies with more equitable access to resources, and above all, to recover from the continuing ill effects of European-American 
created enslavement of Africans and indigenous peoples, colonialism, and subsequent appropriations of labor, still calling for and deserving reparations. Additionally, a variety of migratory movements for which the Caribbean has been legendary have also coincided with or helped to produce a series of radical political and cultural movements in different locations in the Caribbean islands, the Circum Caribbean, and the Caribbean diaspora, stretching into the Americas, North, Central, and South. In my definition, the Americas, America, is not limited to the United States of America. The term number two, the term gender, as used in academic theoretical context, refers to a social category imposed on a sex body, the outcome of prevailing Western systems, which created a binary division between what is identified as male and female. Persistent inequalities between women and men were also fundamental to this definition. As defined originally by June Scott in Gender, a Useful Category of Historical Analysis, that between what is defined as woman and man and called gender, rendered, on, rendered one side of this category called woman as automatically disadvantaged. A persistent question has been, how does gender work in human social relationships? This has been answered in part by Judith Butler's definition of gender as performative but her definition remained confined to the European American gender subject. Three, Caribbean contributions on gender have come from both intellectual, activist, creative, and performative contexts. I want to identify a few of these in the time allotted for this initial presentation, using some of my own research and suggesting other future research possibilities to illustrate. A, Claudia Jones, Caribbean born in 1915, was able to make decided links in terms of her own politics because of her own because of her anti-imperialist posture with other African American women struggling for liberation. Her famous essay, An End to the Neglect of the Problems of the Black Woman, 1949, is one of the first to attempt to launch a particular place for the study of black women in the United States. But she would also offer an identification with the struggles of Puerto Rico and resistance led black, by women like Blanca Torresola, who appears in a poem titled For Consuela Antifascista. Blanca Canales Torresola had headed the 1950 uprising in Puerto Rico in their struggle for independence from the US, served a five year sentence in the same federal reformatory for women in Allison, West Virginia, where Claudia herself was incarcerated for almost 11 months for communist membership and organizing Clearly, another person who I, although I've done a lot of work, still deserving way more study. For example, all her journalism is open, and I hope somebody takes up the challenge and pursues that. B, Grace Campbell. I was happy that my colleague, Lyndon Lewis, mentioned Cyril Briggs, who was one of the leaders of the African Blood Brotherhood, but there was a woman, Grace Campbell, 1882 to 1943, who has a Guyana connection. She also deserves substantial study, she was the daughter of a Jamaican father and an African-American mother, identified as carrying both of these identities. She became the sole woman member in the leadership of the African Blood Brotherhood, which was an organization which had as its primary goal, the advancement of black rights and the immediate protection and liberation of Negroes everywhere. This is an organization which at its height in 1920s had over 7,000 members. C. Amy Ashwood Garvey, one of the co-founders, I repeat, one of the co-founders of the UNIA, defined herself after her work with the organization in New York as in several diasporic circulations, but always identified herself as a feminist, as a pan-Africanist feminist framework. Besides her various European and African surgeons and her proposal for a project on studying the African woman, she traveled throughout the Caribbean in the late 1950s and 60s organizing a number of women's organizations in Barbados and Trinidad, and Trinidad and Tobago. D, Audre Lorde offers a series of positions that have been useful on the issue of gender, even to the framing of herself as sister outsider, the title of her collection. She would have a similar pattern of diasporic movements as her work in the US and Germany and South Africa and the Caribbean indicates. But more significantly, her self-identification with a range of descriptors as black woman, lesbian, Caribbean, mother, poet, 
are all relevantly indicated here for offering contestations of limited Western binary definitions of gender. Additionally, her biomethography, Zami, a new spelling of my name, is a text which needs to be reintegrated in current theoretical work on gender, following new definitions of transversality by scholars such as C. Riley Sutton, 2017. The definitions of the erotic as a philosophical principle as well, as advanced in Lyndon Gill's Erotic Islands 2018 is one of those major contributions that uses Lord's theoretical framework. Also, her Grenada Revisited essay, which condemned the US invasion of the tiny island of Grenada, is an explicit identification of a politics of the critical US excesses in the Caribbean, such as the perpetual threat of war that exists perennially and now in the Southern Caribbean, Venezuela, Trinidad in the course here. So four then in conclusion, finally, it's important to close with Sylvia Winter, who has now become one of the leading and recognized theorists from the Caribbean, but one who offers a rejection of the gender first argument or the class or race first proposal. Race versus, you know, coming with Garvey and so on. This is, and of course, class coming with um, mostly Caribbean left and Marxist feminist readings. This is best captured in her afterward to Out of the Kumbla, titled Beyond Miranda's Meanings and Silencing the Demonic Ground of Caliban's Woman. Sylvia Winter would argue that the human in particular has been co-opted by Western man who has instituted himself as the human bioeconomically constituted and therefore with the corollary, corollary that all the deselected others have to consistently argue themselves into recognition that gender, class, race, and all those other identified major discourses are still argued within the above order of knowledge, which itself has to be unpacked. That gender, as it is identified in, gen in general, is still genre, which leaves white women in charge of the definition of what is the woman. And then from there, we end up occupying the demonic ground, quote unquote. Also, that it is not just the economic mode of production that was produced, but the entire human was also reproduced through this period following European so-called enlightenment and so-called modernity. So in conclusion then, Caribbean positions on gender and social justice continue to be articulated in popular culture, in Caribbean sonic traditions as in literature, offering some of the best theoretical angles which inform and impact academic study and politics in the Americas with the Caribbean Studies Association being one of the primary places where these discussions continue. Thank you very much. Hello, should I go, Tavis? Yes, go, go right ahead, Dr. Nixon, yes. Oh, okay, <laughs> I was waiting for you. Okay, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to share really an honor and, a, and such an honor and a blessing to be in conversation with Professor Lewis and Professor Boyce Davies, whose work I am so inspired by and do my very best to build on. And so I've been asked today to, to think a little bit about uh, the focusing on sexuality and social justice. And so I want to say, of course, that the intersections between race, gender and sexuality will emerge as they must, along with color, class, nationality, religion, ability, and other markers of identity. My work is grounded and guided by intersectionality always, which of course, as we know, coined by black feminist and legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, but I think it's important to recognize the ways that the, this notion of intersectionality is one that was long demonstrated by people like Audre Lorde, and of course demonstrated in the work of Kamba Kambahi River Collective in 1977, which is probably the, one of the most, I think, important moments to identify as a demonstration of this intersections and the intersections between race, gender, and sexuality. And I also wanted to acknowledge Audre Lorde, who I want to talk about, uh, and uh, Professor Boyce Davies already brought up her very poignant and important essay, which I wanted to also reflect on today. As, as an example, if we're going to talk about Caribbean contributions, uh, I think for my, my part today, I want to share 
uh, some of the thinkers, writers, and scholars who've given us the frameworks and the ability uh, and the examples and uh, the work for us to have these kinds of conversations and have demonstrated how we do this in our organizing work uh, as well. And so I wanted to just share one quote that I think from 1977, the Kambahi River Collective, when they thought about what it meant to organize at the intersections, uh, they always thought about it through these lenses. And I think we're still in this struggle. And so I think it's, uh, I wanna just read it. We are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression and see as our particular task, the development of integrated analysis and practice practice based upon the fact that the major systems of oppression are interlocking. And so we are here, here still in this struggle in 1977. We could read this today anywhere and it still applies uh, for so many of our experiences. And I think the important thing, point to think about, especially for, uh, for Caribbean diaspora folks living in empire, as many folks would describe it, uh, came to these kinds of very political and powerful analyses because of that lived experience of simultaneous oppressions. And so when I think of Caribbean contributions to sexuality and social justice inside and outside the region, I think of people like Audre Lorde and June Jordan, born, of, born in the US, but of Caribbean parents. I think of others like Michelle Cliff, Jamaica Kincaid, Iwij Dantakat, Anna Marine Laura, and Nalo Hopkinson migrant writers who consistently represent the Caribbean in all its complexity and defiantly, especially around issues of sexuality, gender, race, and class. I also think about scholars and activists who work tire tirelessly in articulating, representing, and helping us to understand what it means to fight for gender and sexual justice. And so I want to particularly highlight the work of Kamala Kempadu, who was long demanded that we think about sex work in particular kinds of ways and that we highlight and theorize about sexualities uh, apart from gender, not just gender and sexuality. Angelique, we're having trouble hearing you. Angelique, do you want to try turning your video off? Angelique, sorry, we're having we're having trouble hearing you. Okay, so while we wait for Angelique to rejoin us because of technical difficulties, one of the things that I wanted to talk to the panelists, particularly since they have raised lots, I think, lots of interesting questions. I think um, Lyndon talks about this notion of you know um, of trying to think of, of standing on the shoulders of activists, and Carol talked about or mentioned the idea of reparations. And so the first question I have for the panelists, and please feel free to ask questions in the question and answer uh, box on your screen. There should be a question and answer box on your screen. You can just ask those questions and then I'll take some questions after uh, this first question. And so I am curious from the panelists, if they can tell us a little bit about the interchange or relationships between the Caribbean diaspora and the region um, in addressing various types of social justices. In asking you to address various types of social justices and the, at the intersection between uh, the relationship to the Caribbean and the Caribbean diaspora, I don't think we can have a conversation without making mention of some of the things that are currently going on in the US. And so I'll also ask you if it's if possible to make some of the reference to make some references to some of the things that we're seeing in the US, particularly around this idea of Black Lives Matter and, and what does that mean for both uh, structural and systematic racism? Tavis, do you, do you want to go back to Angelique? Because I think she was okay before we started. 
Okay, perfect. I can pause that question. Uh, Angelique, are you able to, are you back? Are you able to, to continue? Yeah. Yes, I'm back. I'm so sorry. No um, the internet goes up and down. So I'm going to keep my video off. And I, I'm not really sure what, <laughs> when I cut off. Uh, but I was, I was actually getting to uh, emphasize the, the point I was making around someone like Audre Lorde, who made it her point, and, and I write about her in my work and building on the work of uh, Professor Boyce Davies about the idea of how someone like Audre Lorde always brought a very sharp critique around U.S. imperialism. And quite literally, when she returned to the region, I think it's very important important for us to understand that someone like Audre Lorde who had a particular kind of politics and what I describe as a revolutionary desire for home and black liberation that she was very clear about her sexuality her blackness her being a woman and a poet and all of her identities that she really uh, demanded that we do more that all of us do more and I think I, I hold her up as an example of the kind of politics one uh, one ought to have, and she used her privilege as you know being what she would describe as an African Caribbean American to speak out against U.S. imperialism, and to speak out. I think that her work offers us a really important and poignant example of what it means to live in these realities. And I think the the points and the and the and the struggles that she identified from Grenada. Uh, to to the U.S. Virgin Islands still apply for our very, very precarious region. And um, just to say uh, that, just moving quickly then into the question you just posed, I think for us in, in the Caribbean, uh, we think about precarity and we think about uh, the kinds of, of violence, colonial violence. We know that colonial violence is grounded and built through white supremacy. And so, of course, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement that's risen up globally, we of course identify with what's happening in the US because we too have experienced it. We also see and experience uh, the, daily, uh, the daily forms of violence, whether it's through poverty or police brutality and violence. And one of the things that I've, that I've written about recently is how well, the, the response to Black Lives Matter in the Caribbean, especially in Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago, uh, people, activists identified specifically uh, police violence and black youth uh, in poor communities who've experienced violence and spoke out about it. You also found that a lot of folks talked about the intersections of black, poor, black women, black LGBTI plus lives, uh, thinking about those intersections. And that's why I started with uh, talking about what, what does it mean to think about multiple forms of oppression and how they are experienced and lived. And so, I think absolutely one, you know, folks articulating it as a standing in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, but also people taking up Black Lives Matter to think about it in the context of our region, where uh, race and class uh, dynamics are complicated, so is color. Uh, and so, you know, we have to have those conversations. And I hope that today, uh, I know that today we will be talking about those. And so I will pause there and we can continue. Thank you, Angelique. Uh, either Carlo, Linden, do you want to pick up from there? I can go. Um, the, one of the things that has struck me is the taking down of the statues and the rapidity with which one sees it happening in so many locations. So I've been calling it unfinished decolonizations and I'm calling this generation doing the work that finishes because there, there were so many um, pieces that, that people um, in the Americas, North America here, and also in South America and the Caribbean, tried to do, but were not able to achieve or got stymied or got co-opted or got whatever. So this is like an unfinished, I mean, also leaders got killed, right? Um, assassinating people like Walter Rodney, assassinating um, um, Malcolm X, um, sending people into exile. All of this has been part of the package. So global racism, we have to, I keep saying this, should be no longer a debate about whether there's global racism. Because often we have Caribbeans and Africans who say they didn't, never experienced racism until they came to the United States. But what we are seeing now is that people are getting more informed about how these processes are systematized and operating in spite of your knowledge 
or in spite of you are not being called a bad name or N-word or what have you, but that the structure is already racialized. So I was really blown away because I went to Bristol a few years ago and I write about this in Caribbean spaces. And I walked through the town and I went to the museum and I learned that 1,200, 1,200, I'm repeating, slave ship journeys sailed from Bristol. The man named Colson, who they just took down, was one of the leading shippers and slave, you know, slave mer um, merchants in that, in that town. And in fact, the rest of the town is built around the fact of enslavement, names and so on, street names, but also, um, you know, the wealth, the economic wealth of, of that town was, was enriched because of enslavement. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say then is this whole question of the ways in which the, we are intertwined in different ways so that policing, for example, is something that people experience in different locations in similar ways and sometimes more horrendous ways. There's an image of somebody in Mauritania being with, his, with a, a, a policeman with his knee on the person's neck as well. Policemen share techniques. They travel from place to place. They get training. NYPD can go to wherever in the Caribbean. Um, Israeli police train other people in the neck technique, the knee technique, and so on. So basically, we have policing um, through a various set of forms of, of global racism and imperialism and racial capitalism, which is meant to protect property. So this is one, and certain classes of people. So when the President of the United States says, police are there to protect us, who is the us that he's talking about? So essentially then, what is going on then in the rest of the world is visible on television. People can see and understand the images. So media circulates, everybody got CNN, everybody got uh, access to various media, and then of course the US military, and then of course the market. So I try to look at all of the ways in which these things are connected. So I'm really, I'm, I'm really energized, but I'm not surprised that this next generation has really seen the need to complete a lot of those things. And I'm really happy that finally there's discussion about taking down Columbus in Trinidad. That has been one of my pet peeves that there were still slave masters and people of, of Columbus's um, generation and stature still being represented that people have to walk around and see them every day without any thought of the implications of what their uh, presence means, just as the Confederate soldiers are also coming down. Thank uh, you, Carol. Uh, one, one, of, one of the things, one of the points that I was trying to make at the, in my initial comments is uh, if we understand that connection between the Caribbean and South Carolina and the broader United States, then I think we have to understand that there was always this connection that was based on issues of race and, and, and exploitation and brutality and all those things. So this is nothing new. They're just different iterations of what happens. It's a cyclical kind of thing. And I think that one of the things that we need to look at is the, 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 the way in which um, their economic, in particular, economic and sometimes political um, motives that force people out of the Caribbean and into places like the United States. So once you're there, and you know, I think that there's a, a whole literature on the idea of deterritorialization and re-territorialization, right? So that there's a consciousness constantly, not only about where you are, but about where you have come from. And in, in the case of a number of Caribbean people, um, they, there's an importance, there's an economic importance about remittances to the Caribbean. When we look at, at um, the, the, the balance of payments in the Caribbean, there's a very important line there that talks about remittances from abroad. Now, what is happening with, the, with the, the current pandemic is that those remittances have, be, have declined by 20%. Uh, th this is a particular hardship for people who are in the Caribbean who depend on their survival uh, from those remittances. And so we're, we're there. There's, there's also, in terms of what you talk about as the, the, the Black Lives Matter, I think that it is a, a, a consciousness that emerges from time to time. I, I remember in Barbados uh, at, the, at the, the, the walk to freedom of Nelson Mandela, 
that um, Hillary Beckles was asking to rename a particular park uh, as the Man Mandela Park, which uh, a number of people um, disagreed with. Right now, there's a, there's a controversy, uh, a continuing controversy in Barbados about pulling down Lord Nelson. I remember as a, as a, as a young child in Barbados, growing up in Barbados, that um, there was a boast about how the statue of Nelson was erected before the one in London. Uh, and and it, it made a little bit of sense to me until I went to London and noted the, the difference in the size of the structure, right? Uh, at which point I, I couldn't understand what the boast was about. But it is embarrassing because that particular statue is in the heart of the business community in Barbados. And there has long been a uh, discussion about the removal of Lord Nelson, who to the best of my knowledge, never set foot on Barbados anyway, uh, from that position of prominence to some other place, right? Uh, the most that they've done in Barbados is to turn him around. Uh, but right now, the, given the, the, the heightened consciousness about what these, the, these statues mean, I think that there's a renewed emphasis on the removal of this particular structure. But as, as Carol talked about it, the, the, we now have a vibrant social media, which, may, which, which doesn't shrink the world, but our understanding of who we are and where we are is now much more accessible. And to the extent that it is, whatever happens in the United States is, is, is recorded, is discussed, is debated in, in the, the Caribbean. I, I'm, I'm usually amazed at how assiduously people in the Caribbean follow the politics, for example, of the United States. And this is because they have relatives here. They have brothers and sisters. They have people upon whom their, their very economic survival depends. And so it is, we, we are now in this real global global world with this um this this internet the the, the 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 connectivity that makes it a lot more um um urgent in terms of our of our understanding of it thank you um before we go off into questions the one thing that that struck me um in terms of the interconnection between race gender sexuality and social justice is and this goes back to Carl's point of saying that, you know, it's this generation, hopefully they can, they can fix it, is how do we then begin to, to teach about race, gender, sexuality, and social justice um, in the Caribbean, given some of its fraught history, and particularly, for example, thinking of things such as the um, LGBTQ legislation that was just passed in the US, um, and then in the Caribbean, this sense of the under recognition of persons who identify based on uh, different sexualities, whether they're bisexual, pansexual, uh, et cetera. Then how do we, how do we educate the, the next generation to see not only the intersection between these things, but allow them to continue to carry out some of the vital work that we need to do um, across Caribbean societies? I can jump in. Um, I had said something about that, but I don't think folks heard me because of my internet going in and out. But just to say that, you know, I think that that's one of the things that uh, my work around uh, with Kai, so sex and gender justice and doing work around LGBTI organizing in the region. I mean, you know, there's been so much done. And I think that's, probably, you know, some of the most uh, fiercest uh, activism and advocacy have been around not only the legal challenges, which are complicated because of the savings clause issue, and also because of the uh, because of the influence of, uh, in particular, the evangelical churches and other uh, religious bodies that are um, are not as open to change, especially on the legal front. But in terms of cultural and social norms, I mean, I think that there are all kinds of ways that we have consistently embraced various genders and sexualities. But I think some of the challenges are uh, that, that, yes, there are certainly the conservative and, and traditional uh, norms that police gender as it does everywhere. But I really try to, to stay away from that narrative of Caribbean exceptionalism around homophobia. Homophobia and transphobia exist everywhere. And we are not exceptionally so. Uh, it exists everywhere. 
and people in Fox do live uh, their lives. Um, those of us who are who are LGBT plus, those of us who are queer, people are trans, people are all kinds of sexual and gender identities and live. And yes, there are struggles, but I do think that one of the important things to think about, and I think that's what we see in the activism around Black Lives Matter and how people intersect is a clear class analysis, right? An analysis of which communities are most policed. And I think Anton um, Alahar mentioned this in one of the, the comments that we have to think about class like as a very as a, as a very determining factor of people's experiences. Uh, and so, you know, in, in Trinidad, we have a, a police force that's predominantly black. We have a complicated uh, and multi-ethnic diverse space, just like in Guyana. And so when we talk about race and class relations, we need those nuances, but we also need to be able to talk about anti-blackness and how it functions and how white supremacy has pitted people against each other, right? And I think that sexuality becomes, unfortunately, sexuality becomes an easy scapegoat for our problems. Oh, these things are happening because so-and-so or because of this or because of that. Or it's easy to say, oh, that's coming from the global north, that coming from Europe and America, that thing, sexual thing, I don't know what that is. But we actually know when we dig deep into our families and our, and our friends and we look at our histories and histories, we know that people have long lived complicated lives sexually and uh, by gender. And so I think that's that, that's the space of, and some of those scholars I spoke about, I don't know if everybody heard, but people like Kamala Kempadu, right? And Gloria Wecker, who've been doing research on, on gender and sexuality for years and years to show us that our spaces in this region are so diverse, especially when it comes to sexuality. And in fact, when you see the fierce activism and the, the, the scholarly work and the activism and the art and the literature that come out uh, about our region, we see that reflected as well. I can say more, but I'll stop there. Thank you, Anjali. Lyndon or Carol? Um, I think, I think the, the question of, um, of sexuality is a very complex one in the Caribbean and um, issues of homophobia. So I, I think that sometimes we, we generalize about them, but I think that there are um, different kinds of responses in different parts of the Caribbean. And they're, they're, they're more liberal um, responses to, 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 to things like homosexuality in, in, in the Caribbean and different parts of the region. Um, there, there are some places that are more open, are more, in, in, in a way, enlightened. Um, and there are other places in, in which it, is, it, is, it could literally cost you your life, right? Um, so I think that, that that's one of the things that we need to talk about. I think also uh, that Anjali makes a, a, an interesting point about the class issue. Because sometimes when you think about the issue of sexuality, uh, in 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 certain in certain classes, it's generally accepted by people in that class, right? Um, and and I think that there's a way in which sometimes people's class privilege uh, gives them a sort of insulation from some of the harshness and the brutality uh, and and the harassment of of their sexuality. And I think we need to talk about that because we know people around. We know people in government, we know people in, in, in high offices in the Caribbean who, are, who are, are bisexual, who are gay, who are all kinds of things. But there's a way in which the, the class privilege gives them a, a, a protection from the kind of person who will be beaten up on the street. And I think that we need to, to understand that. But I am not sure exactly other than talking and writing about these these issues, how we get to the next generation. Now, my, 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 you know, there's always this thing about the older generation thinking that they need to, to, to tell a younger generation what to do. It seems to me as though the young people are emerging in a context where there are lots of things that are changing. And I think that they have an increasing consciousness of those changes. And they don't always see the things in the same binary ways that we see them. And I think we have to give them some credit for that. Now, uh, that's, I'm going to say that in this context. In another context, I'm going to say that I'm not sure what they're doing. 
but but I, I'm being generous now, and I'm saying that um, there 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 are times that I think that we have to give the young people some credit for the increase in consciousness, for the openness to certain kinds of ideas and 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 orientations than we we currently give them credit for. Yeah, absolutely. Linda, I'm agreeing with you 100%. And I think actually that's what, what heartens me so much. I think there are some amazing young, dynamic Caribbean feminists and um, social justice and LGBTI activists who work together, um, who have taken a, a, a storm on social media uh, to write about these issues. They, you know, they call each other out, they call folks out, they say things and are really defiant in the face of a lot of respectability politics. And I always feel really inspired um, by folks who are, you know, rejecting gender binaries, are who are very happy to talk about uh, all of their experiences from whether it's experiences with, with disabilities or experiences with different kinds of religion um, and it, dealing with race, dealing with class, talking about their sexuality um, and, you know, also being an environmentalist. Like they are very, you know, very clear about taking up, um, taking up space. And I think, I think that is what is very heartening. Uh, but also to agree with you around around you know that we have to talk about class privilege and we have to talk about color privilege and we have to talk about the ways that that you know impacts how people might experience various kinds of things uh and you know i'm always i always say that you know our precariousness and, and the kinds of economic precarity uh and the economic violence uh and uncertainty that we experience across the region, and you know th that that all is mediated by these different things. But it, you know, but at the same time, then uh, we are we are all struggling. Um, and I think that uh, I think that to do the work of breaking down all of one's you know the, the baggage of privilege or being able to acknowledge privilege is where we the, the work that we need to do to help us to be able to organize across difference. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I am Christina Hines. I am the program chair. And I am here to take some questions. And there are quite a few questions that have come from the participants. So I'm going to try to go through as many as I can. So far, I have 10 questions. So the first one, where are Caribbean scholars, activists, and artists today in their influence of social justice in the US? There are such rich genealogies of resistance in the US by Caribbean folks. So the question is, who are the influencers in this contemporary moment who are Caribbean and in what ways are they influencing contemporary movements? Go ahead, Carl. <laughs> you need to unmute Carol. I know I did, I've tried to. I'm trying to. You, I'm mute. I'm muted. Can no, you? you're not. No. I can hear you. I can hear you. You can hear me. Oh, cool. Yes. I, you know, I am. Um, um, I think in this generation, many people are children of. So I would imagine that there are quite a number of participants who we don't know unless you stop and interview them. In other words, I don't think it's as as the the, the distinction is as rigidly defined as it would have been a few years ago when we're talking mostly uh, people like Stokely and others who were students, not so, but had migrated to the US and were very still much locked into um, a Caribbean identity. But I think many people are children of, um, and I, I think if we start asking questions that will come out, but that's a good question because one, um, you don't see the visible Caribbean um, presence as you had earlier, but I believe they're there and I think it's a good area for study so we can find out, you know, what, what Caribbeans are doing. I saw one parade in uh, Brooklyn, but it, it, I mean, using the Caribbean jumping up um, approach, but that's how we do. Um, and, and I thought that was still, a, I thought it was a commendable um, uh, parading uh, in Brooklyn itself, but I, don't, I can't answer beyond that. I think it's worth studying to see what, I mean, this is the kind of work that people, that, like you, you all were talking about education earlier. 
and teaching, this is the kind of work that next generations could need to be doing in terms of research. So we know who people are and what kind of um, contributions they're making. And I believe it will come out. And I think uh, related to the earlier question, I'm not as worried. I think I was more worried about my generation in terms of questions of sexuality, which many people studiously avoided even when it was visibly in the text. Um, but now, um, I think we have students who would not let that pass, at least in the U.S. Um, and I would imagine ch people are informed by social media and all kinds of other, other uh, ways of getting information so that if the academic information doesn't keep up in terms of how to engage young students and young people and talk about work, then they will get it elsewhere. And that's been happening consistently. But we want people to be informed and knowledgeable. So we, I think we make a distinction between scholarly work and what happens in that, and then, of, of course, other kinds of work where people share and pass information among themselves. I, I think that um, I, I think that's a good distinction, Carol. Um, there are lots of Caribbean scholars in, in the United States and in Canada um, and in England who are working consistently on a number of these issues. Um, what, what we don't have as many people doing is leading those um, social movements, such as, as a civil rights movement or uh, a Black Lives movement. Um, although now and then we would hear of an individual who, who becomes part of that movement and, you, and then you, you subsequently hear that this person's from the Caribbean. Um, so we, we don't have um, people identifiable as a Stokely Carmichael, as a CLR James uh, in, in that way. But we have a lot of scholars, including one on this panel, Carl Boyce Davies, um, who, who, who is working um, from a Caribbean perspective and at the same time engage in what is happening in the United States. The other person that, uh, that comes to mind immediately is Edwige Dantica who is doing some tremendous work, not only in her field as a literary person, but also in terms of increasing the consciousness of what is happening in Haiti and what happens between the relationship between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Uh, and uh, so I think that there are a number of people like that around. I'm not sure that there are, that I can identify specific leaders of particular groups right now in the same way that we could have uh, identified, um, you know, Garvey or Hubert Harrison or somebody like that. I think also yeah. the nature of leadership is different in this group. So that's another question I think we need to mix. It's not just focused on the sort of messianic figure, but much more group-centered leadership, the kind of thing that Amy Jakes got, we talked about, or Ella Baker, um, so that you have a different, I think it's a good model because you don't have, although they have killed some Black Lives um, activists, you know, mysteriously, they, you know, they lose their lives or are killed. Um, but I think it's a good technique so that you don't have the one person who, if that person leaves or is attacked or assassinated, then you have nobody. So it's a different model of leadership, I think, is evolving in this group. Um, and also Canada, if we think, I'm glad you mentioned um, North America in different ways. Because the Afro-Caribbeans in Canada, like Ronaldo Walcott and Beverly and others, they are doing, I'm sure they are involved in activist work and doing different kinds of organizing in that Canadian space. So I think the US, Canada has a different kind of packaging of black identities, which is much more Caribbean centered um, than it is in the United States. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll just interject here by letting everyone know that when you participate in TSA activities, you'll meet some of these scholars and people doing that research. Um, to the questions, there are two that are related that I would like to ask here. One is, do you envisage the Black Lives Matter movement to spearhead a global impactful role in social justice activism within the Americas? And the second related question, where do you see this movement going in the next 10 years? Well, I think it has already impacted. I mean, one of the things that, that we know, uh, th there's somebody who sent me a link with the Black Lives Matters um, protests in Brazil, in, in, in Portugal, 
in, in Spain, in France. I, I mean, I think it has already made an impact. And perhaps because of the global nature of it, we might actually get something out of it, right? Um, what has happened, you know, one, one of the, 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 the things between Malcolm X, for example, and, and, um, and Martin Luther King, is Malcolm X was critical of Martin Luther King because he talked about civil rights. And Malcolm says, you have to move out of civil rights, otherwise you're just dealing at the national level. You have to get to human rights. And I think that Black Lives Matter is talking about human rights and it is bringing a message that a number of, that a lot of people can identify with in terms of police brutality, but also the, 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 the blatant acts of racism. Right? And by the way, one of the things that we, we talk about all the time is the, is the hardcore acts of racism. And I remember um, uh, somebody wrote that um, it is not just the, 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 the frontal attacks of racism that affects us. It is the daily visitation of slights. That's the one that affects all of us, right? Uh, because it, it, it doesn't come at you in a full frontal way. But I, I, I think that, that, um, that, that to see it as a global movement is, is exactly what we are already witnessing. Uh, and that is why so many people are, are energized by what is happening in the United States. And it is feed, and, and I think, you know, one of the things that we should bear in mind here is what was happening in Africa at the time with the independence movement was able to feed into the Black Nationalist Movement and the, the Black Panthers Movement and Black Power Movement in the United States. And they built on each other. What is happening in the United States with the Black Lives Matter is, is being generated and, and globalized. And I think that they're both feeding off of each other. And, and I think it is a, it's an important um, relationship that, that we're, we're building. Christina, you're on mute. Would anyone else like to try that question? Angelique or uh, Prof. Boyce Davis? Sure. Hi. Uh, I mean, I read, uh, just agreeing with um, Professor Lewis, it is already a global movement, You and it took only a few days, really, as the uprisings began, because people, you know, it, the, the, the similar experiences, an entrenchment, and the shared experience experience of colonization and dehumanization uh, that you know people of African descent experience around the world I mean I think that is what's happened and one of the things and I've written about this is that you know I think it's time for us to uh, especially uh, in in the region it's time for us to activate some of our most brilliant thinkers and scholars and writers and activists people like Walter Rodney um, and you know Sylvia Winter and uh, Amy Cesaire and Fanon and Andaye and Seward Hall and folks who gave us an understanding of how to talk about race in our Caribbean and, and, and in our families and in our structures. And I think that, that gives us a lot of, of the tools that we need, I think, to dismantle. And I think this is the time that we need. This is what I'd like to see for the movement, that we're dismantling systems of oppression. We are rebuilding. And it means that we have to have some really honest, and, uh, and, and difficult conversations. Uh, and it means that we need to confront power and privilege and state and police violence, even when folks uh, look like us, we need to do that. And so that's where I see some of the, the, the transformation that we must happen. And, and, and we have to fight against this whole thing of meritocracy and how global capitalism functions and our over-reliance and over-dependence uh, on tourism and foreign investment, I think for the region that those are the kinds of things that I that I want to see, and I'm hoping and I'm hopeful um, are emerging uh, and also you know very clear in this moment. Could, could I could I just add something? Um, one of the things that also um, uh, generates an interest in what is happening is that. We have this racial consciousness that is, that is building 
at the same time that we are in the midst of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the pandemic has done is it, it has unmasked the inequality of capitalism, right? And, and I think that people are recognizing the nature of the exploitation more, more viscerally than they have in the past. And I think that that is what is also resonating, right? So it is, it is, a, it is a public health crisis, but it is also profoundly an economic crisis that we're facing at this particular conjuncture. Okay, thank you. I'd like to move on to some more questions. We have a question that asks about religion. The role of religion as power that undermines solidarity, especially among women and the poor, when the opportunity for equality in the law is a possibility for women in the Bahamas, the efforts are derailed through gay, gay marriage, slash rights, boogeyman, propaganda. There is a related question that asks about the conservative religious right and its role in undermining some of the social justice movement. And I'd like to come back with another round of questions after this one before we run out of time. Thanks. So whoever wants to go, feel free. Some of us have stopped going to church, so I, I'm not good at answering this at all. But I, what I can say, though, is there is a Black conservative power structure in the U.S., in the Caribbean as well, and they often hold down um, systems that manage and benefit them. I, I, the same way that the people talk about a small percentage of people owning their resources in the U.S., one has versions of that in the Caribbean and Africa and other locations. So that question of inequality, uh, and I, I think Linda answered that really well, uh, particularly in terms of the economic vulnerability of people is where it is. But I think the conservative religious um, structure has been part of it all along. They still, you know, talk about um, African religions in very pejorative terms. And so it's, it's, it's a panoply of of conservatism that comes through the church sometimes and also sometimes radicalism. So in the US, you can have a black radical church, but you can also have as Reverend Bible, but you can also have a conservative church that is, is you know, coming hard against people who um, practice a different sexuality and so on, live a different sexuality and so on. So you, I think you have all of these contradictions operating by religion. Um, and for many of us, like I went to a church where the guy was just horribly, the minister was horribly talking about why he preferred Israel over Palestine and giving that as a sermon. And at the end of the church, when he was at the door, I said, well, why would you do that? And he said, you know, Can't come and talk to me about it later. But the point is he had had a whole sermon, which he was educating people about in very politically biased ways that did not really give the proper history and so on. But that was looking out of a religious space that was very narrow. So I think we have those contradictions operating and we have to navigate the ones, if we wanna be religious and not spiritual, uh, we have to navigate how we operate in them. I, the way I think about this is that um, really hardcore religious people, you're gonna have a, a rough time trying to change that, right? Um, what I ask instead of, of, um, instead of seeking acceptance is to say, can we look at this in terms of human rights? Is it possible for you to stand outside of your religious conviction and to think about the relationships that people have? Uh, is it possible that you can think in terms of, of somebody choosing to be with whom they want to be? as opposed to dictating that this type of person should be with that type of person. And I think if that, that you're much more likely to get some, some, some sense of an opening if you approach it through um, human, in, in, in human rights terms rather than in purely religious terms, because you're fighting against entrenched beliefs about people who have a particular notion of what 
their sexuality should be. And they feel that this is ordained. And so I think that you have to say, can you be a little more um, open to the possibility of thinking of this in slightly different terms or in profoundly different terms um, and see if that works? Uh, jumping in, uh, Christina, hi. Uh, so I'm thinking about, just thinking also about uh, what uh, Professor Lewis said, agreeing, but also, you know, the the power of some of this, the conservative, especially the, the evangelical and other um, Christian churches, the power that they have to mobilize money and their really homophobic, anti-gay rhetoric, uh, where they've, they've lost footing around same-sex marriage and other places in the global north, and they've turned their sights on the global south. And I think we actually need to be really critical of that money. Sometimes that money is being mobilized to come in and put together these uh, conversion camps across the region. It's happened in Guyana, it's happened in Trinidad, it's happened in other places. And I think we need to really speak out about that kind of very problematic um, very colonial uh, relationship that uses religion and uses people's spiritual beliefs against them to even do harm to people in their own families. So I think we have to speak out about that. And I think those of us who do LGBT activism and work in the region, we've done that. We've done some of that. And, and I think uh, what Professor Lewis said around, you know, trying to use the, the, the language uh, of love and acceptance uh, uh, as, a way, as a way to arm ourselves against that. Um, and, and respect people's beliefs. I think one of the things that Kaiso has done in Trinidad is that we always say we're of all faiths. We respect everyone's faith. And in a multi-religious and multi-ethnic space, it is important to say those things. And finally, I just want to say about religion too. I think it's important for us to do the work uh, to look at our own African syncretic religious practices and spiritual beliefs to see the ways in which we were very accepting of diverse genders and sexualities. So, you know, a lot of folks who do work uh, on Haiti and uh, Vodun and thinking about other, uh, the ways that, that that in particular, you know, Vodun as a practice was very open to different kinds of genders and sexualities. And I think it's important for us to fight against that that, ne that colonial narrative that uh, diverse genders and sexualities come from somewhere else and they're not a part of us. And I think we actually do need to do that work of saying actually, yes, they are a part of us. And at the same time, you know, uh, making sure that we're thinking about all of the connections uh, and that we're very clear um, about the, the entire political spectrum of being all of our identities that we don't just show up um, as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, that, but that we have race, ethnicity, religion, class, sexuality, and acknowledging all of those diversities, and also the ways that we mobilize power and privilege in different ways through those. Thank you. Those are wonderful answers. I was also thinking about Rastafari when y'all were talking about religion and how important it can be as an Afrocentric spiritual approach, but also very problematic from the gender side. And speaking of gender, we have some questions related to gender here. There is one that says gender justice still feels like a subtext. Somehow in the struggle for social justice in the Caribbean, we worry about removing statues and I will not call the name of the politician stated here, is live and in charge. Um, and then there is a related question that says one of the recent movements in the US slash world has been the Me Too movement. Can any of the panelists speak to how this movement played out in the Caribbean? Were there similar movements to Me Too in the Caribbean? What was the impact? Do you know of the activists and how this movement has engaged with sexual identity, sexual harassment, sexual assault? Who would like to go first? I think we should start with you, Christine. I, 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 I think you no, have a lot to say. I think you have a lot to say about this. Really? Well, I wasn't prepared to answer questions, but I certainly do think that there has been activism in the region from personal experience. I know there has been some as, as one of the activists. There have been meetings. There have been things happening in public and in private. And you know, it does really resonate with me, the, the question about gender justice being a subtext, because some of 
the activism I see in Barbados and through social, social media does focus a lot on um, men who have been targeted. And women also face a lot of other types of violence and brutality that are not really at the forefront of this movement. But I don't want to take up space here. I would like to pass this question, these two questions over to the three of you, our invited guests. I think, Angelique, the question was asking specifically about what's going on in the Caribbean with Me Too. So I think Angelique probably is best positioned to answer that. Oh, thanks, Carol. Um, yes. So I just want to point out that um, Life in Leggings, and anyone can do a search. If you just type in hashtag Life in Leggings, started in Barbados, and Christina, uh, you might be able to share a little bit of your experiences with that. Uh, but Yes, yeah, so a life in leggings started uh, before Me Too um, in terms of the recent Me Too uh, iteration. And uh, in Barbados started the sort of spark of sharing stories of sexual assault on street harassment on people shared, people shared um, their stories. It was done across Facebook. Uh, some on Twitter, and then folks shared those stories in uh, on blogs and so on. And then there was in twenty uh, in twenty seventeen, we had this was the beginning of twenty seventeen. There was a regional march in solidarity with Life and Leggings. It was a really big deal. It was on International Women's Day, seven countries, uh, and folks spoke out in very clear, defiant ways. Uh, women, in particular but also folks in LGBT plus community shared experiences of gender-based violence. And it sparked, I think it sparked an entire movement that's really important for us to identify, um, to identify. And there's also the tambourine army, right? That happened in uh, Jamaica calling out uh, the sexual assault and abuse by people in power, in particular religious leaders. And it was, you know, again, please do searches on it. You can find uh, many, uh, you can find many resources that share uh, those particular histories. In Trinidad and Tobago, we did something um, using Calypso Rose's song, Leave She Alone, Leave Me Alone. And we started a campaign around that and became like a feminist anthem. Um, so there have been so many things. I feel like we, but at the same time, hearing the question that does it feel like gender justice is coming last or is being left aside, I mean, not, not for those of us who are out here fighting for gender and sexual justice, I think we're doing it. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it does feel like sometimes it's overwhelming, but I think there are many activists, many of us who are consistently saying we are not letting anything go. Yes, we're gonna talk about all of the issues. And yes, it may take us 20 minutes longer to have this meeting or this conversation because we wanna add all of this, but we're gonna do it anyway. Uh, and there's a lot of fearless, fearless leadership around these issues. Okay. Would anyone else like to go? There's also that question that asks whether gender issues are kind of eclipsed in Black Lives Matter. Does anyone want to try that one? I, I don't think that they're eclipsed. I, I, I yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Carl. No, I don't know if they eclipse the three founders of Black women. That doesn't mean that automatically, you know, because you have a founding presence as a woman, but clearly I've seen all of them talk and they consistently make sure that questions of black women are identified. And people like Kimberly Crenshaw, see her name, constantly brings back in the naming of um, women who have similarly been um, abused or killed by the state, the Breonna Taylors, um, and so now Tatiana Jefferson and many others. So I think the tendency is just to the, the visible version that we saw um, with George Floyd, I think, probably dominated. And, and, and keep in mind, I, you know, people have looked at that imaging. It's very sexualized as well, the way he killed him. Um, and it, it brings up a lot of the kind of Fanonian reading of, of, of sexuality in terms of those two. Not the woman, because Fanon is horrible on that. But um, between white men and black men. Um, so that question is in there, but I'm, I'm saying that I think the visibility of George Floyd and what happened 
probably clips a lot of the larger questions, but I, I know for sure that it comes up all the time. Definitely in Louisville, where, where Brianna Taylor is from, uh, consistently there have been marches in her, um, in her favor. Um, so, yeah, I think it's ongoing. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think that the gender question is being left out at all. I think it is very much uh, a part of what the Black Lives Matter is. Um, and, and, and as Carl is saying, a number of women are leading the charge on that. I think that um, the, the gender justice part, in the, you know, I'd like to see more men in the Caribbean um, become more active in articulating these matters of gender and, and, of, and of justice. Um, I don't think that there are in, enough of us uh, in or outside of the Caribbean who see it as a serious problem. I mean, one of the things that, that, um, that I'm constantly um, amazed by is the level of violence that I see against women. Whenever I pick up the, 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 the Starbrook News or the Trinidad Express, or the Jamaica Gleaner, and um, and and I, I wonder what kind of impact this is having on the attitudes of men. Now I know that in some ways people have seen this as a zero sum game, and so uh, as, and so what what they think is that if if women are, are treated differently, that somehow it takes away from the status of men, and so. Um, what, what you get, I think, sometimes is a, a reaction from some men to the, the strives, the, the, the progress of some women. And I think that is unfortunate. But I, I, I would like to see um, more, more men in the Caribbean address some of these issues. Um, I, I don't see enough of it. Thank you. So these are the final questions. I'm sorry to anyone whose questions we have been unable to answer. And this one speaks about the use of technology, social media in particular. And there are two related questions that I'm joining. One asks whether or the extent to which social media has been blocking out the effectiveness of academic and intellectual engagement so whether it is possible for students and the general public to listen to us, meaning um, the ac academics, the academy, with all the rest of this information. And the other question asks, how can social media platforms be used to create awareness about social justice? And that's the final question from, from the audience, rather. Oh, I guess I'll jump in. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's already being used. I think that that, that social media has um, offered platforms of, you know, uh, almost instant uh, communication where people can share ideas, people can organize. And those of us who remember what it was like to organize before cell phones and before you know, Facebook, um, you know, that was a different, that was a different way. It was a completely different way of organizing. And, and, you know, when I think back to it now, I'm even more amazed to look back at moments um, like Black Power Movement and, and anti-colonial struggles and how people were able to mobilize uh, without technology because we're so infused now with technology. And so absolutely, I, I think it's already there. I am always impressed by the ways that we are using social media, which can have a very, have, can have the other side, which is very conservative and a lot of propaganda, but we can use those same tools to activate, share consciousness, share ideas, uh, and put, you know, lots of history and information that we, we might need to, you know, contextualize our movements. You know, we have folks who use social media platforms to condense it and make it shareable in ways that are really important, especially for younger folks. Um, and also deal with issues of accessibility and making things, you know, make sure it has captions, you know, see if we can get someone to do different kinds of interpretation and make sure that, that it's accessible to as many people. Um, so that's, that's where we are. And, you know, if you are not sure about it, just find organizations across the region and social justice groups around the world who are using Twitter, they're using, um, you know, Facebook groups, but, but in particular, Instagram and Twitter, um, and Tumblr are spaces where I think you see a lot of very active 
folks who do organizing around social justice and share, um, you know, YouTube, it, it's endless. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think that in the region, we still, in my, in my organizing work, Facebook is a very important medium, but increasingly we're using Twitter, increasingly folks are on Instagram, and those are different ways to share information. And, and I think that that's what our, what our organizing needs. We need to really make sure that we're streamlining and sharing information. And for the, you know, those of us who are teaching, I think we all use uh, social media in different ways to share uh, and show and, and, and give our students and empower our students also to like do different kinds of things using social media. So absolutely, it's there. Yeah, I was, um, I wanted to approach it from a little, I think the students who come back in the fall to, to our classes or to the university uh, will be asking different kinds of questions as well. And so I think that's the, the impact will be the other way around. So somebody had put, um, posted something about which professors will be able to really discuss systemic racism in their classes. And, and I, was, I responded by saying, definitely not the ones who do not read our work. And there's, I mean, there's so much work that Caribbeans and African-American scholars have, and African scholars have produced over the last 40 years, but it's not really part of the central part of most universities. It tends to be very much enclave still in, in Africana or, or not, there's really not a Caribbean studies um, unit in, in every university. Some universities may have a, a small uh, a faculty teaching that or managing it, but it's not really part of all of the institutions. So CSA and organizations like that tend to be a place where a lot of this knowledge circulates. And this is why we try to get our students to join and attend and so on. If they wanna write about the Caribbean, then they need to be informed and have the scholars who work in those areas actually be able to listen to their work or advise or talk or what have you. So I'm just thinking ahead. I think in the next years, all these people who have been on the streets listening and talking, they will want a different kind of teaching, I hope, right? So I imagine when they come back to campus in the fall, um, that faculty would have to be thinking ahead about what kind of courses and information they will circulate. And that way the knowledge uh, is able to move. I, re I have a sense as well that a number of the people you see also out on the streets are people who were in some of our classes. So they have a good sense of, of some of the languaging of, of systemic oppression and global racism and racial capitalism and so on. If I could um, just remark on two things. One is in terms of who are the people which professor that, that I, that's what I teach. I teach uh, classes on, on race and inequality and, and human rights and, and that sort of thing. So I'll continue to teach that and upgrade it to incorporate exactly what is going on. But I wanted to make a point about our perception of complex connectivity, right? Um, a lot of people, I, I think there's a, there's a, a perception that we're all on social media, that we're all on Facebook, that we're all on Snapchat, and we're all on... Look, this is the bourgeois part of us, huh? right? The rest, the rest of the world is not on these things. And so I don't think that we should get carried away by thinking that, that we are all on the same um, internet platforms. Right? There are lots of people who are excluded from that kind of thing. And I think that we have to be, we have to find ways to reach those people. And part of it, the way that we reach those people is the same way that they organized the bus boycott, right? They didn't have any of those things at that time. And so they went out into the communities and they talked to people. So I think that we, we, that we, it is possible for us to operate on two fronts or more than one front. And, and we can't just assume because we have access to, to technology, that everybody has access to technology. It will be sadly diluted. Perfect. Uh, at this point in time, I would like to thank our candidates and ask if there are any closing remarks you have um, that you can give in approximately one minute as we are currently out of time. We're almost at time here. And so any closing remarks that you may want to leave us with or any food for thought that you think um, we can take away from this discussion that we've had today? Hi, 
Hi. Okay, I'll do, go first. Um, just to say thank you for this conversation. And I think we certainly need, um, this is only the beginning. We could talk about so many things. And thanks to um, Professor Lewis for bringing up the question of accessibility. I mean, that's been a major challenge for us, uh, you know, at, uh, at, at the UWI, moving to online teaching and doing our work to try to make sure that students have access because we had to switch suddenly to online teaching. And it was, it's not been easy. Even my internet, uh, it's in and out and it's been a consistent challenge. So just even, not to mention um, the other um, issues of whether people even have access to the internet. And just to say that I think that's why a lot of the organizi organizing here and you know, that I've done in Trinidad, we think about other forms of media. We always think about print media newspapers and certainly the radio um, radio ads and, and getting on the radio has been a major way uh, that we've thought about our organizing work. Uh, Christine had said perhaps we should say a couple of things about reparations because there have been lots of questions. I mean, I think that reparations should be always a part of the conversation and we should be thinking about it uh, in all of our work. How do we talk about it and how do we make space for us to understand it? I think we have a lot of discord and a lack of understanding about what it means when we say reparations. Um, in my work, I've talked about it in relationship to the over-dependency on uh, tourism and, and, and where those structures come from, which are out of the plantation. I also talk about it in relationship to the material, uh, the material realities and the benefits that Europe um, on North America have from the very blood, sweat, and tears of our ancestors and our spaces. And so I just want to close by saying that, you know, there's so much uh, rage and so much ancestral rage that we share on whatever our work is, let's be up to that, whether it's dismantling, sharing, having conversations, organizing, whatever our strengths are, whatever it is that we can do, whether it's talking in our own families about these difficult questions of race and class and color, um, or, or in, in our teaching, we raise it. And just to echo what Professor, um, what, what Prof uh, Boyce Davies said, you know, for those on the call, you know, teach the work of Caribbean and African American scholars, thinkers, and writers and artists. Share those um, because there are so many, and we've done an amazing, uh, there's an amazing collection um, of work that is out there. And you don't need to, uh, you don't need to, 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 create that class about institutional racism on your own or how to talk about race uh, because we have so many. So I just want to say thank you uh, for this time and I look forward to other conversations and thanks to the Caribbean Studies Association for this. Yeah, I wanted to say a couple of things that Lyndon triggered. Um, I was, when, I, when we went on Zoom, Angelique, so that you don't feel bad, we, um, there was quite a bit of <laughs> adjusting on all sides. But I had a student who is from Arkansas, a grad student, a PhD student in history. And in her town where she lived, when she went back home, there was not proper internet. So she couldn't even access the class. So we can't assume the US, I mean, talks about other countries that don't have um, proper and full service, Cuba and so on. But certain places in the US also are not covered. And that was an amazing eye opener for me. So she had to actually leave her home in Arkansas and go to family in Memphis. My class was, that class was one night a week. So she could actually access internet so she could take the class. So, and then of course, questions of having, um, they had to figure out how, how to get laptops and so on to students around. And then if you got the laptop, not everybody had internet in their home. Somebody may have a phone that they use and so on, but what do you do to share that so that your child can use that laptop and be connected? So the connectivity, you're right. It's not even, and in the U.S. as well, there's no, there should be no assumption that everybody, single body, every single person has that ability. I think the Caribbean Reparations Council 10 point is probably one of the most thorough. And we need to always say that people are already paying reparations. A number of universities have had to start doing things uh, to pay in the United States. Princeton, seminary, some of them had slaves and so on. Um, Georgetown sold 200 slaves or more to get money to pay off a debt. So the question of reparations is being raised in a deliberate way. And I think we should really heighten that. And one of the ways is to make sure in your teaching, you have a unit on that, whether it's poetry or what have you, so that students get to understand that debate and can take it forward in, in different kinds of ways. Um, and yes, to teaching all the work that we do and making sure that we share our knowledge and, and increasing that pool of knowledge that we have. And thank you again to CSA for hosting this. 
Yeah, I just want to add my thanks to CSA um, for organizing this in lieu of the conference that we should have had in, in Guyana, and I hope that this would happen next year. And thanks for the opportunity to uh, meet with my colleagues uh, on the panel. Um, I think that one of the things that the, that the current situation does for me is it, 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 it gives me hope. It gives me hope. And at the same time, it is scary, right? Um, because of the nature of the thing that, that, that stimulates the, this outpouring of protests, that is scary if you live in the United States and if you look like me. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about that. But, it, but to see a number of young people out there um, uh, pushing uh, for changes is, is, a, is an area of, of hope. And I think that we should all be energized by, by the enthusiasm that is there. And I hope that, that this becomes something um, that is uh, that, that that we can identify with down the road. That it isn't just about people marching, but that it it, it leads to fundamental changes and hopefully profound structural changes in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Alto panelists. Violetta, you're on mute. Violetta, you're on mute. Yeah, I just want to say it was it's a thrill to listen to all you and the wisdom and the experience and we've just been really, really uh, happy to have this collaboration with CSA. Look forward to next week where we've been so inundated with people that want to join that we are going to make it Facebook Live next week where the topic will be the Caribbean diaspora's role in building a just Caribbean and American future. So please join us and thank you so much. Thank you all and have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks. Hi, Angelique. You still need to call me. <laughs> I'm... This does not take the place of the call. Bye, Linda. No. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay.